The natural way of mankind is completely unnatural. I'll explain myself in just a moment, about five minutes time. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembert. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. Thank you for joining us as we go through the Bible in one year. Hopefully you are joining us through the Bible. That's fascinating. And as we study today, Leviticus chapter 15, it will be interesting. Corey is here to help us. Corey, what's going on? I'm talking about a lot of things today. We're gonna to be looking at the Day of Atonement, Tabernacle, Holy Ground, all sorts of good stuff. Ryan? Well, today I'm doing a study on the Hebrew word Azazel, which has been translated in the King James and New International versions of the Bible as the scapegoat. Very good. Look forward to that, Janice. Today I'm going to talk about what's in our heart. All right. Very good. So take your Bible out and take your Bible guide out. This is the Bible guide. And I'll tell you how to get one of those a little bit later, but we need to listen to what God is saying to us right now. So let's read. Leviticus 15, verses 1 through 12. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in regard to his discharge, whether his body runs with his discharge, or his body is stopped up by his discharge, it is his uncleanness. Every bed is unclean, on which he who has the discharge lies, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes, and bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. He who sits on anything on which he who has the discharge sat shall wash his clothes, and bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. And he who touches the body of him who has the discharge shall wash his clothes, and bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. If he who has the discharge spits on him who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes, and bathe in water, and be unclean until evening. Any saddle on which he who has the discharge rides shall be unclean. Whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until evening. He who carries any of those things shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and shall be unclean until evening. And whomever the one who has the discharge touches and has not rinsed his hands in water he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. The vessel of the earth that he who has the discharge touches shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. Leviticus chapter 15, verses 1 through 12. Leviticus chapter 15, chapter 16, and chapter 17, as we continue going through God's wonderful word, we're in Leviticus, or that which pertains to the Levites. Now we deal with the issues surrounding sin. Sin is a horrible thing, and it is something that affects us humans. All of us are born under sin. Now human beings have natural uncleanness, which is considered normal, by today's standards, because we are used to it. We don't normally measure ourselves against God's holiness, uh, I guess against his perfection. If we did this, we would quickly realize that we are altogether unholy. When Jesus Christ came to earth, that is fully God and fully man, he made a way for us to overcome this effect of sin. When we believe in who he is, confessing our uncleanness to him and dedicating ourselves to following his ways in our lives, then his holiness makes us clean. We can become holy to God, but not without the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus Christ. When God sees us, he observes the cleanliness of the Lord Jesus Christ because of his sacrifice instead of our unholiness. 
So Christians then are people who have confessed their uncleanness to God and have committed their lives to follow him. The ancient law of the Lord expressed the uncleanness that naturally comes from humanity. I want you to remember that in Leviticus 15, we determine the fact that sin has caused a lot of these things. And we're going to talk about that today because we are speaking and we're looking to the generation of the past as God speaks to them. But the Lord has forgiven us. So we need to see the work that Jesus Christ did. This is absolutely fascinating. Now take your Bible guide and turn to today's passage as we begin to read it. And let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would help us to see your word. Help us to see that the effects of sin and what it cost and how that Jesus Christ covers those effects of sin and helps us in the name of Jesus Christ. This is what we say. And we all said together, make it so or amen. That's how we say make it so. We say amen. All right. So when we look at the Bible, we understand that God speaks. Now listen carefully. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in regard to his discharge, whether his body runs with this discharge or his body is stopped up by his discharge, it is his uncleanness. Every bed is unclean on which he who has the discharge lies and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. Verse five, and whoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. He who sits on anything on which he who has the discharge sat shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And he who touches the body of him who has the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Now this God speaks clearly to this group of people and to us to see the effects of sin. Mankind has sin. It has become naturally unclean in all things. We are naturally unclean in all things. The Lord God has offered a way for our, the only way our spirits to become clean before him. When we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives, when we say to God, forgive me of my sin." I want to change my life. I want to come to be, to to follow you. Then things change, beloved. We need to understand that. And so as we see that today, this is what they were talking about in the past with the uncleanness of human beings. We see sin today is the same effect. I find that fascinating. Interesting too. Now let's go on to the scripture. Verse eight. If he who has the discharge spits, on him who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Any saddle on which he who has the discharge rides shall be unclean. Verse 10, whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until evening. Time limit on it. Fascinating. He who carries any of those things shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Which takes me to this point. Sin is such a terrible thing. It corrupts everything it touches. The Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price for sin and won the war it has waged on our soul. See, sin creates a problem inside of us. And it creates a problem that manifests itself or makes itself known on the outside of us, beloved. So we need to understand that when we take Jesus Christ and begin to change our lives, that changes everything. And we become different people, beloved. We we are not people who are the same. You know, there's a lot of people who say they're Christians, but are they really? Have their lives changed? 
Our lives have to change. We have to serve God. Now, salvation is free. It's complete. But when we serve God, our life changes. And that becomes very important. That's why James would say the same things. Faith without works is dead. So we have to understand that. When we're changed, we are different people. Fascinating. Let's look at the next passage of Scripture in Leviticus 15, 11, and 12. Here's what it says. And whomever the one who has the discharge touches and has not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. The vessel of the earth that he who has the discharge touches shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. I'll tell you, sin is, it's unbelievably horrible. Sin leaves a horrible stain of corruption on all things. Jesus Christ made a way for us to recover and be restored from sin. Being cleansed from that deep, dark uh, discharge of sin is so important. And the only way it can happen the only way we can become new people, the only way anybody who has been lost in sin can make himself clean is to come to Jesus Christ and to say, Lord, I need you. I, 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 I'm, I can't do it. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit comes in and something happens to us. Again, I'm going to say it just so we can hear it again. The Holy Spirit comes into us and we become changed different people. And that's what Jesus Christ was saying to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. He said, unless you're born again, you cannot really understand this change. And my encouragement to you today would, would be this. Come to Jesus Christ and be born again. Give your life to him and repent of your sin. So reading about the Day of Atonement in the book of Leviticus brings up all sorts of questions for us in the 21st century. This idea of sacred space or holy space is not really a regular feature of today's Christian worship, but it clearly was to ancient Israel. So how did they understand holy ground and holy space, especially considering the serious rules for the priests when they would approach the Holy of Holies? So the Holy of Holies was only to be entered on the Day of Atonement by the high priest after he had ritually purified himself and offered a sacrifice for his sin. Uh, the Day of Atonement's purpose was cleansing. The sacrifices and rituals removed the nation's sin so that God's presence could remain among them. And symbolically, it purified the tabernacle and holy space itself so that God could continue meeting with Israel there. Now, the idea of sacred space, temples, and tabernacles that we see in the Bible were actually largely shared by the cultures that surrounded Israel in the ancient Near East. Interestingly, there were certain sites that were believed to be connection points between heaven and earth, which is an idea we do see come out in Genesis in the life of Jacob when he has a dream at Bethel of a staircase on which angels were ascending and descending. So, in the other cultures surrounding Israel, when a temple would be built, a sacred site would be sought out or decided on through divination. Now, later in Israel's history, King David would be directed by God to the location of his future temple. But here in Leviticus, the Israelites are living in the wilderness in a transitory state. So the tabernacle is portable, obviously. The sacred space becomes wherever God chooses to show up. His presence is what creates sacred space. Both of the Israelites and all of the surrounding ancient cultures aim to protect sacred space by setting up 
progressive barriers that marked out progressively holy spaces. So in the tabernacle, this looked like the fenced courtyard, then the covered holy place, and then the separated holy of holies. This structure emphasized the holiness of God, and it protected the holy place from being corrupted in any way from impurity, and ensured that only the holiest of people approached God's perfect holiness. In the ancient world, the temple was seen as the center of life. They were houses, residing places for gods. So in the pagan world, mankind actually worked to strike a balance. They offered sacrifices and performed rituals to take care of their gods' physical needs so that the god could focus on their work of maintaining life, crops, health, warfare, whatever their specialty was. So the sacrifices of food and drink were seen to physically cross into the spiritual world to feed their God. And the process was accomplished through rituals of opening the mouth of an idol and through rituals like the burning of sacrifices and offerings to transmit them into the heavens and through pouring out drinks onto the ground. Now in Israel, the tabernacle was not seen as a house for God, but it did house the place where God would meet with Israel, who was represented by their high priest. The tabernacle did not house an idol, an image of God. Instead, it had the Ark of the Covenant, which held, of course, the covenant, the basis of that relationship between Israel and God. When the covenant was in good standing, God's presence could and would be with Israel. So then it's no wonder that God chose to appear above the physical copy of that covenant. In Israel too, the tabernacle seems to have been the center of life and sacrifices and rituals were commanded by God in the same methods we see outside of Israel, the burning of sacrifices and offerings and the pouring out of drink offerings to give them or transmit them to God. However, sacrifices in Israel were about thanking God for his provision to the people and about recognizing that human sin needed God's pardon. Specifically, the blood of the sacrifices was seen to have a purifying element. The extent of the blood rituals recorded in the law of the Bible seems to have been unique to Israel. Israel needed to keep their need for God's forgiveness front and center. And though the rituals that were to take place on the Day of Atonement do have some ancient parallels, like the scapegoat sacrifice and the need to purify the tabernacle or temple, uh, in other cultures, the king and the priests alone were purified. But in Israel, it was the whole nation who was purified, driving home the point that God wasn't just a petty or lower God. He was actually the God of the entire world. And it wasn't just the Levites who were his priests, but the whole nation of Israel. See, God had a global agenda and Israel was called to mediate God's plan of salvation for the world. What's interesting about this is that when, in terms of feeding the gods, mm -hmm. okay, this was a common thing yep. in the ancient culture. But God, several places in the Bible, it says, Paul said this, for example, in Acts 17, mm -hmm. a thousand years after the temple was built and all of that, he doesn't live on food. You know, yeah, God and in is, Psalm 50, God says, I, I don't, like, even if I was hungry, I wouldn't ask you, but I don't eat the meat of bulls or, or drink the blood of goats. I don't do that. So God steps out of that presentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that's really important to remember. And reverses it. The people's offerings to God were thanking him for his provision of food to the people. Very good. Yeah. Excellent, Corey. Ryan? All right. Well, today my focus is on Leviticus chapter 16, which records the institution of the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. And what's really fascinating here is that two goats are chosen. One is for a blood sacrifice and the other is left alive and driven into the wilderness, bearing the sins of the people. Now, the King James and the New International Versions of the Bible call this goat the scapegoat. And this is actually a translation of the Hebrew word as a zeal. But a lot of Christian scholars believe that scapegoat is the wrong translation of this word. And the question is, are they right? Well, let's take a closer look. One of the most important and critical elements in Christian theology is atonement. Atonement refers to the covering over or removal of sin, and interestingly, more than half of the occurrences of the word atonement in Scripture are found in Leviticus chapter 16, which describes the Day of Atonement. This annual holy day celebrated the covering of national sins by the offering of two goats to God, one killed and the other driven into the wilderness. 
Indeed, once the sacrificial goat had been offered, the high priest laid his hands on the head of the live goat and confessed over him the sins of the people. The goat was then sent away into the wilderness, bearing away with it the sins of the people. That both of these goats anticipated and typified Jesus Christ's later passion is not a subject of debate among true Christian scholarship. In fact, it was the renowned Old Testament scholar Gleason Archer who declared that each sacrificial animal referred to in the Mosaic Law symbolized some aspect of Christ's atoning work. On this point, virtually all Christian scholars agree. However, where not all agree is in regard to the goat which the King James and New International versions of the Bible call the scapegoat. The Hebrew word is Azazel, but there is uncertainty regarding its meaning. As a result, various explanations have been put forward. Traditional expositors believe that Azazel should be taken as a proper name of the goat itself, meaning the goat that departs, hence the conventional rendering of scapegoat. However, some scholars believe this interpretation is incorrect, since the goat was released to or for Azazel in Leviticus 16.8. An alternative interpretation says that Azazel referred not to the goat, but instead designated the area to which the goat was released as a rugged or desolate place. Still, several scholars reject both of these interpretations because of the parallelism of Leviticus 16.8 which they say demands a personal name to be in opposition to the Lord. The verse reads, Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Based on this, these scholars connect Azazel with some sort of a desert demon, in particular the leader of the demons. Support for this identification is found in the apocryphal book of one Enoch, where Azazel is the head of the rebel angels. Of course, this latter interpretation is not without challenges either. For example, one of the main objections with this view is that the scriptures clearly forbid sacrificing to demons. On the other hand, as one scholar points out, there is no hint of this goat being a sacrifice. This goat is not ritually slain, there are no rites with its blood, and it's not burned on an altar. Rather, it carries the sins of the congregation to Azazel and leaves them at their source. Okay, so as you can see, not all Christian scholars agree on the meaning of Ezazel, and that's okay because Christian scholars do all agree on the main point of this whole biblical episode, which is that Jesus Christ was and is the ultimate fulfillment of the Day of Atonement, and of all the Jewish feasts for that matter. And that's what we need to make known to our Jewish friends. Even though they have no temple, no priest, and no sacrifices, they still observe the Day of Atonement every year. But as Jerry Vines notes, what our Jewish friends need to know is that the day of the Lord, that the day the Lord Jesus Christ died at Calvary, he fulfilled the day of atonement. When Jesus said, it's finished, our sins weren't just covered, our sins were put away forever. Now, praise God for that. Now, if you wanna watch this segment again, then just head on over to my YouTube channel, which is just my name, Ryan Hembry. And do make sure to subscribe and click the notification bell. That way you'll be notified when I release new videos. And the great thing about YouTube is that there are no time limits. So I'm able to really go into more detail with a lot of these videos more than I can on the program. And that's important. Thank you, Ryan, very much. Excellent. Janice? What's in our heart? You might think this is odd for a chapter that's dealing with laws concerning bodily discharges, but in this passage of scripture, the fact that an unclean man could be cured of the discharge points to the fact that this was a medical or a physical condition that he could be cured of. So what I thought was very interesting was when we get to Leviticus 15 verse eight, it talks about a man spitting. It says, if he who has the discharge spits on him who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Let's take a look at spitting. Spitting was a gesture of extreme contempt. So this action that this man seems to point not only to his outward uh, uncleanness, because it says he who has the discharge spits, but this action of wickedness from the man's heart. So I look at that and I think to myself, all right, God is able to cleanse us and heal us on our physical body, but let's take a look at how Jesus, God, knows our very hearts and the intents of our hearts. 
And as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we make that commitment, when we ask Him to forgive our sins, and we commit our lives to follow Him, what we're doing is giving Him access to our hearts. And God not only can heal on the outside, but most often, and I would say every time, He heals from the inside out. And such a big part of that comes from the attitudes of our heart. Listen to 1 John 1, verse 9. It says this, If we confess our sins, and that's to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this scripture, Rod, really reminded me of the goodness of God, the full intention of God, not just to heal our physical bodies, but to heal us fully. That when we come to Him in repentance, when we recognize that He is God, that He is our Creator, that He is our healer, and He has made a way through His Son, Jesus Christ, to receive that cleansing, to go from unclean to clean, not because we deserve it, not because we're such good people, but because of God's love and of God's mercy, that He extends that grace, something that we don't deserve, yet because He loved us first, we can receive this gift of salvation and eternal life where He and His shed blood is what makes us clean. And there is no one, Rod, who has not sinned. All of us have sinned. All of us are unclean. All of us have some portion of wickedness in our hearts. But God in His grace, God in His mercy that endures forever, comes in and changes that. What an amazing thing that we can have in our relationship with God. I challenge you today, get to know Him. Thank you for praying with us today. Let me say that we have a new program called Beyond the Call, Testimonies of People, starting this month. On the YouTube channel, Pastor Hembry, Pastor Rod Hembry, that's what you wanna look for on YouTube. And you can join us and you can watch it. It may be on some of your stations as well. So keep an eye, it's called Beyond the Call. In the meantime, let's pray and say, Lord, help us today as we praise your name that you have healed us from the effects of sin. This is what we praise you for. 